Okay, this is the next video podcast, instructional podcast, and today's topic is literacy concerns. Um, this will be out of order from what it says on the syllabus, but they'll still be at the same time. We'll flip-flop and do the specific instrument one next week, but I wanted, based on what we talked about today in class, I wanted to go to this one. So, um, you're looking at your handout for literacy concerns, and I'm just going to go through this. I think this, in many ways, might be the most important one of these uh, podcasts that you're going to be looking to because it's applicable to almost any situation that you're working at um, teaching music and so forth. Some of these things you will note that um, we did talk about already in class, but we can't talk about them often enough, in my opinion. First off, some prerequisites you need to get off the table right from the very get-go. Students must recognize and understand the musical alphabet. In other words, as I demonstrated to you in class, showed you today in class, it's important they understand the musical alphabet is a circular alphabet. It is not a linear alphabet. Every other alphabet they've known, worked with, have any comprehension of up to this point is linear. Music is circular um, and represent it that way and uh, they'll be much better off. They have to have an understanding immediately almost in terms of literacy of the uh, musical staff, the function of bar lines, clefs appropriate to their instrument only initially, time signatures, pulse, and subdivision. Um, time signature again, I would not introduce variance in time signature until it comes up as a need to know type of thing, but nonetheless they need to understand the function of time signature. Um, more important than that, I think initially, is the concept of pulse and subdivision, that they have a good, clear understanding of those things. Um, again, you've heard this uh, with wind players, brass and woodwind players. I think it's imperative that they pat their foot. Um, you, these are the only instruments that they cannot count out loud and play at the same time, and you need some sort of uh, visualization of their understanding of the pulse and beat if you will. So um, do that. Also very, very important that students um, from the very get-go um, be able to vocalize note names, counting system, solfege, and articulation syllables as they're appropriate to each individual instrument. Um, again, the idea is we use all this information for communication. Um, the more information they can communicate, the more information that you're communicating that they understand, the more successful you're going to be and uh, the better off they're going to be. Um, again, going on now, students, what they don't need to know initially, key signatures prior to reading music, but they do need to understand the effect of flats and sharps. Um, so again, if you think about what the whole focus of key signatures and everything that entails, obviously that is not in the, the window of their need to know for quite a while until they're ready to move into different key centers and such. So really truly until you're ready to teach scales, which we discussed today. Um, however, they do need to know right from the very beginning, and I don't think it's too much for them to understand, that simply a flat lowers pitch, a sharp raises pitch. Um, and d just demonstrate that. Think of an analogy, if you will. Uh, you lower the air in a rear tire of a car, the car goes down, you sit on something sharp, you jump up. Okay. Um, as we have been in class, I think it's, uh, again, a very, very helpful situation to have the students in terms of their technical skills, their tonal skills, um, their understanding of the instrument skills to be well ahead of what they will confront in terms of literacy in those source materials, whether it's the method book or something you're preparing or something that you uh, distribute to them other than the method book. Um, it's, it's The literacy, for the most part, is going to be the trickiest thing to comprehend for them. Um, so much of the other uh, aspects of instruction dealing with tone and their instrument can be taught with much more uh, rote and guided practice situations. Um, you want to be able to apply those in the literacy in a very free sort of way without the, the, their coordination or ability to create it, the sound that you want and such being an, um, uh, an obstacle to them being able to demonstrate what they know or have to, have to know in terms of literacy.
So get them ahead of that. Uh, another kind of, I don't know what you call it, fun fact or whatever that can often be confusing that can really be simplified in, in a short way that's noted on here. Just basically know that the, the role of a dot in, in rhythmic values. If you put a dot after a note, it adds half the value. If you put a dot above or below the note, in other words, a staccato, I know it's really a different kind of dot altogether, but teach them above or below means it cuts half the value. Now, in truth, a staccato sometimes more or less than a half of uh, the ratio of the sound that we eliminate, of course it is. But for them, at that point, it just simply is a fact of knowledge. At least they know it is a briefer, it, it shortens the duration of the sound of the pitch that you place a staccato on. Um, printed resources. This is really important to remember. Homogeneous classes, classes that you have the advantage of teaching by their individual instrument flute class, trumpet class, trombone class, whatever. Consider, is the method book, is it necessary to have every single student in the same method book exclusively? Could there be another method book, one perhaps written specifically for the flute player, one specifically written for the horn, something like that that would fit your situation better? Now, with that said, there is an advantage of if you choose to use alternative methods like I just alluded to still having them have the source consistent method book that way sort of you're checking yourself you can use that as supplemental material and you're checking yourself that all your students and all your classes are being exposed to the same spectrum of uh, knowledge and musical experiences um, as an addition to what you're doing in that uh, book that you or source that you pick out for the homogeneous class. Um, I think it's really really important that you consider having lots of resources at your fingertips and putting forth the effort for you to create materials yourself, borrow materials if you will from other sources and create materials that teach specific concepts and skills to your kids um, create them custom for that particular class um, and that particular day in that particular class um, in addition to what you have as published materials. The, it, it's so much easier and so much more effective creating your own supplemental materials to suit the needs that you know you have as a teacher and you know they have as students rather than trying to make this material that was created one size fits all work in those situations when you want to get very, very detailed. So uh, seriously consider doing that and keeping those as a collection that sort of ever expands. I would bet that if you do that, I know if I went back right now, I don't know that I would use a method book at all for most of my instruction. I think I would set down at the beginning of the week or the beginning of each day if time allowed or every other day or something and prepare materials exclusively through note flight or Sibelius or Finale, whatever you're most comfortable with and uh, for each individual class. So you have very specific. And you don't create those from a blank slate. You're not writing a method book. You're flat out stealing things from many, many, many method books that you know fit your situation. And, and that's what a really good teacher should do. Um, another thing that I, I needs to be stated, it's so obvious, but, but I think some people uh, do, I, I know people do it because I've seen people do it. Um, this book, right here that you all have. It's, it's as good as any other book for a homogenous book to use with all these different classes and such. Um, it may have some things that are better than others. It may have some things that are uh, weaker than others. Um, it's just a matter of personal opinion and interpretation. But one thing it isn't, it is not really designed to be used line by line. Um, the lines do have to be in order because they're in print and, you know, printed material has to be in some sort of order. But consider, the, 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 you already know through our own experiences, we have played lines that have been further in the book than ones that are earlier in the book that are more challenging. We have skipped to lines later in the book to demonstrate a specific um, concept or technique. Um, you know, use the book. This is resource material. This is not... Moses did not come off, and this isn't the broken third tablet. 
He didn't come off a mountain and say, thou shalt not skip lines, thou shalt start with line one and follow it by line two and therefore. Um, be smarter than that. You as a young teacher, what is tough is you don't know this whole book yet. And so you're not quite sure what's there. Well, guess what? Take some time, get to know it, look through it, make some notes, um, think about what, what's there. Even in our limited exposure that you have with it in this class, that's not even hardly a starting point to seeing all that is involved in here. Okay, continuing on. Um, this is one thing that some people really like about the Essential Elements book um, is the idea that it starts with quarter notes in 4-4 four, four time. And so that allows all the coordinated motions, physical motions that are going on to execute those quarter notes, all occurring simultaneously. In other words, the mind, the foot tap, the eyes following across the page, um, everything, the tongue as you articulate those quarter notes, everything moves together. And so you uh, um, avoid some of the um, coordination issues, starting with longer value notes. Um, that whole concept of this note lasts four counts, but it's one note, can be very, very confusing. So creating sound at first, this really works good. Uh, make sure students understand a note means to create a sound, and equally important that a rest means to remain actively silent, actively silent. They still count, they still subdivide. Um, again, don't use the book line by line, vocalize. Again, I've said this before, as you approach lines, you want to find out every way possible whether they truly understand what they're being asked to do or not. The way you understand, the way you discern that understanding is by having them execute the line in various ways. Count it with count, counting syllables, sing it on solfege, chant the note names, um, go through count with pitch, I mean just whatever. Uh, again as we talked about in class at some initial stages, have kids touch the notes as they count or sing those various things. Um, you know, we again, I've, I've discussed quite a bit at this point with you about the whole idea of uh, two modes of listening we have as musicians or sometimes develop as musicians, especially instrumentalists. One is an instrumentalist, we have our instrumental ears, which tends to be um, much different than our singing ears. Uh, you want students to use their singing ears every day, and the best way to do that is to sing every day. Again, then there's a greater chance that you actually might um, incorporate and uh, um, develop some audiation skills with those students as you work through. So um, vocalize everything you can think of uh, and such. During vocalization at times, as you add on the coordination aspects, make sure um, students also learn to start fingering. And when you do have them finger, Make sure they're using good hand position with both hands and good posture. Um, again, anytime you do anything an incorrect way, you're practicing it, doing it wrong. And we want to avoid that at all time. Uh, one other thing on the vocalization, one final thing on the vocalization is it needs to be vigorous and focused. You want them to count with the same sort of student attitude that you want them to play. You want it to be confident. You want them to be not afraid to make a mistake. I've got somebody knocking on my door. Okay, we're all good. You want them to not be afraid to make a mistake. Um, you, you, but, and you want to clearly be able to hear what their effort entails so you can decide whether they understand it or not or to what extreme they understand it or not. So encourage them to vocalize with a full voice, sing with a full voice, um, and make it um, crisp and accurate. You want full value notes, make sure they hold things full value, etc. Teacher behaviors. Ah, these are really important and I think these are all things that we do with good intentions but there really almost no place for them in um, a beginning classroom or even a remedial classroom with instrumentalists. Number one, don't play with students. Don't play along with students. Just that short. When you're playing with a student, 
a portion of you is listening to yourself. Your job is to listen to all of them. Your job is to watch all of them. Now, with that said, model for your students. Play for your students. There's a difference of playing for your students and playing with your students. Okay, got that? So, avoid playing. And again, people do it because they want to be helpful. They want to think they're going to guide students. What you'll discover is you'll think they're doing pretty good, and what's happening is you're getting pretty good. Who knows what they're getting because you can't tell. Um, your job, as it says in the notes here, is to listen, excuse me, and provide feedback. That's your job one. Conducting, beginners, it's a total distraction. It's a total waste of your efforts. You don't need to, one, probably be in the front of the room, and two, they don't need to be conducted. They need to learn to be accountable for pulse in a group together. Conducting is counterintuitive for that. There will be a time, and it'll be very easy, when they have to learn to watch a conductor, when they have to react to a conductor. But don't lessen or cheapen your conducting skills by conducting things that, in fact, there, there's no mean need for it whatsoever. You know, if you're, if you're giving a concert to some kind of dog and pony show, yeah, conduct for the parents. But again, just acknowledge to yourself that what you're doing they, is unnecessary. They could be playing just fine without you conducting. And that means you're doing your job right, if that's a true statement. Um, sing correct pitches from the beginning. Sing correct pitches from the beginning. Sing from the beginning. One little caveat in that. Don't be so harsh on trying to get people to sing correctly that you make them afraid to sing. Don't be too critical of singing, especially at this age with male students who are having a hard time with their voice change and such right now. Um, start absolutely everything that you're not conducting with a down up command. Down, up, down, up, ready, play. You'll get them so brainwashed they'll do it on their own. What are you doing? You're teaching them to subdivide time before they start the exercise or the, the piece of music. You're teaching them to always subliminally subdivide. You're also teaching them to physically subdivide with the foot. You don't even have to tell them that it's subdivision until some point in the future. Um, when they count out loud, uh, count rest, silent, silent, but have them say something if you wish, or you say silent and they remain silent. Um, finger motion. For when you get to the point, it can be very, very confusing. First and second endings, uh, Del Sagno, uh, Alcoda, Da Capa Dakota, all can be very, very confusing. Make sure you talk through those things and monitor them and they show you with their finger that they know how to read the map and such to uh, totally understand those things when you get those. Um, again, positive teacher behavior, probably the one you should be engaging in more than anything else. Watch students' faces to see that nothing moves. Again, calm all the way around, calm. Everything happening should be within and around the aperture. Everything else should be normal. Um, watch hand positions like a hawk. They change very gradually and soon um, those slight changes become tomorrow's bad habits and the longer you let them get away with them the harder they're going to be to correct to the point they might be impossible to correct. Um, in terms of listening which is really hard to do as they're playing all together <coughs> but when you do have them play alone um, what you're listening for in their tone is extraneous sounds okay you want it purer and purer and purer as you hear them and of course your expectations are going to be raised the longer they do it and so forth but that's what you're looking for um, in terms of articulation listen for articulations that are not a part of the sound and try to correct them in other words don't lis listen for uh, tongue sounds glottal sounds in here that are occurring uh, listen for those and try to nip those kinds of problems in the bud um, Something else on listening individually, I, I, and it doesn't say this on his, it, yes, it does in the next category here, going into final thoughts. I'm just going to skip ahead here. Create daily opportunities for playing alone. 
followed with positive comments and suggestions for feedback. Now that doesn't mean you have to have every single student play eight measures of something. In fact, it probably should just be that you have one, each student, maybe twice during the period, play two notes, play two counts, play one measure, play two measures at the most, just where you can hear them. You know, at this stage and even at uh, the collegiate stage, you hear somebody play about a measure and you've got a pretty good idea of how well they play their horn and what their tone production skills are like and such. So um, try to create those opportunities. Don't always just do everything in a group. Um, a lot, some useful things are back and forth things. Uh, you know, first chair plays, everybody plays. Second chair plays, everybody plays. Third chair plays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're keeping the majority engaged all the time, and you're only um, uh, moving away to an individual performance just for a brief hiccup within the overall scope of the class. Um, students need to begin as soon as possible to listen for pure beginning and ends to sounds. Uh, for those of you who are not wind players, we, we do not end sounds with our tongue. We end them by stopping the air from passing. Um, so uh, don't do that. There are some advanced techniques that use that, but I wouldn't be teaching those techniques to beginners. Um, also, try to get your kids in the habit of holding their embouchures and their instruments in place at the conclusion of lines, exercise pieces. So that, again, you're not forcing bad habits as they quickly finish and then just take the horn away. Freeze, then take it away. So this becomes very habitual, very predictable. Um, have obtainable standards. Uh, again, you know, no, don't, don't expect sounds the first two weeks that you would be happy to hear. Um, don't, don't expect to hear sounds that you would want to hear out of third year players your first two weeks. You'll have some kids that just naturally make a gorgeous sound and that's great. Make sure that they keep making that sound. Others though it's going to take some time um, and uh, that's your job is to keep monitoring those things and moving them on. So have the right expectation in terms of those things. Finally, organization, procedures, the routines you use, and constant vigilant monitoring are the keys to successful classroom management. And uh, classroom management is going to be uh, your the, 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 the life or death of your success probably um, in the long run. You've got to learn to class to manage the classroom that's all the classrooms that you're in and that's going to be your biggest challenge and you're going to fail a lot. You're going to fail a whole much a whole lot off, more often than you succeed at first and that's going to be one of the hardest things to get over but there's almost we could we will talk about it and you will hear about it in many other classes but until you get to get out there and have your own students and practice it um, it's 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 hard um, there's not an, an artificial way to teach it or to have you experience it you just have to sort of learn on the job on that one and that's tough you will notice in the packet too um, there's not a set video lecture for the uh, second half of the packet here which is fundamental concerns I think most of these we have talked about in class and um, should seem pretty uh, straightforward. A lot of them are covered in the physical concerns part, but nonetheless, the, there's really, really good information here too, and I would uh, encourage you to take a look through that. That's the end of this. Thank you.